Hi, I'm Kat Holzer. Thank you for joining me for the Retrograde Facebook launch. My novel Retrograde tells the story of an estranged husband and wife who get back together under very unusual circumstances when she develops retrograde amnesia and he realizes she can't remember that they broke up. I think a lot of people on hearing that this is a novel about amnesia will come to it expecting a mystery or a thriller or the kind of genre we've come to expect from books and movies about this topic, but for me, amnesia is more like the setting of this novel, which is ultimately more about the role that the past plays in relationships and the extent to which we're able to communicate unpleasant truths in relationships. And I think that a starting point for me in coming up with this book was the way that many people who are in unhappy relationships or whose relationships have already ended will say things about wanting to let go of the past or they wish they could go back to the beginning, they wish they could start over. And in a way, the characters in retrograde have that opportunity, but ultimately the question for them isn't just whether they can go back and change the things that went wrong, but whether they'd want to. I'm going to read a few chapters of Retrograde now. I hope you'll enjoy them and think about reading the book if you haven't already. And I look forward to hearing what you think. The red light flashing on his answering machine catches Joachim's eye as he comes in. He almost never gets a message. It must be his mother. Everyone else has heard of call ID by now. Before he can play back the message, the phone rings again. Mr. Schmidt, a strange woman's voice asks. She sounds official. Maybe it's something to do with this year's taxes. Yes? Vivanti's hospital. It's about your wife. If he'd ever pictured this scenario to himself, if he'd imagined his next words, he would have expected to ask, what wife? But he feels no such confusion. In the immediacy of the moment, their separation vanishes as if she'd only just stepped out. Is she all right? She can't be dead, he reminds himself, or it would be the police and not the hospital. She can't be dead or they'd come in person. You'd better come in. Helena lies awake a long time the first night. All that time in the hospital has thrown her off schedule. Dozing around the clock, always half sedated. When you're indoors all the time, there isn't much difference between night and day. Your allotted portion of light comes from the window or it comes from a fluorescent lamp. To make matters worse, she can't help feeling acutely aware of each of her injuries, running over the list in her head, feeling her blood pulse past twisted muscles and fractured bones. When she puts her hands to her face, she can feel the throbbing warmth of her bruises, the peculiar rigidity of her skin, and the crooked seam across one cheek she isn't supposed to touch. And her brain, too, is supposed to be bruised, it must have knocked against her skull when she fell, like a piece of fruit rolling against the side of a crate. Retrograde amnesia, both Dr. Hofstetter and Joachim told her, as if she'd forget, ha ha. But would she have known if they hadn't? How do you know what you don't know? She feels the blank space between her and the world now, but if she didn't know, maybe it would all seem okay. After all, what's she missing? She and Joachim decided to separate for a while, but that's no surprise. They were always fighting. That could be just the decision of a moment, something said in the heat of a particularly bad fight. Besides, that's over now, no longer relevant. Well, there's her new job, still graphic design, still advertising, but in a different office with different people. And what else? At least they still live in the same apartment. Not much has changed here, though a few things are missing because of the flooding. 
She suspects that he lost track of where all her things are, which are getting dry clean, which are getting repaired, and so on. Either that, or he had to throw out a lot more than he's admitting, and doesn't want to tell her right away. There's been something off about him these past few days. At first, she thought he was just worried about her, being particularly attentive. But now, listening to the peaceful sighs of his breath at the very opposite edge of the bed, she's sure there's more to it. There's something cautious about him, that's it as if he were taking great care to avoid a certain subject. But what could it be? Is it something she knew already and has forgotten? Or something that just happened? Maybe he's waiting to tell her when she's better. Or planning never to say anything, as if she were too stupid to notice. On the other hand, how can she confront him about it? Joachim, I know you're hiding something from me, and then what? If he says she's imagining it, what evidence does she have? She drifts off in the great void of this question. On the third floor, Helena gets another thrill of fear or excitement when she sees her name above the doorbell. Maybe if they ring instead of unlocking the door, another Helena back then just like her, but totally different, would open it and welcome them into her uncannily familiar life. Dora opens the door, but waits for Helena to go in first. The recognition comes before the strangeness. After all the suspense, all the effort to get here, and the fear of what they'll find, Helena enters the perfectly familiar room. There are her bookshelves, her bed against the wall, the two-person sofa with a folded newspaper on the coffee table in front of it, and in the corner, the little wooden desk where she sometimes works from home. The door to the bathroom, the kitchenette, and the little nook overlooking the courtyard with a folding table, two chairs, and that funny old picture of Port Louis. The first thing she's really aware of is that she's been here over and over again in all the dreams she's forgotten in the past few weeks. She feels the terror of half sleep when the colors start to fade and the walls grow transparent and you can't quite touch anything. But the chair she collapses into, the table she rests her elbows on, are solid, opaque, and very, very real. She's never been more awake never more ready to believe she's dreaming, or less able to. Dora is asking something, but Helena can't hear it through her sobs. She's afraid of this place, of its ineluctable reality. All the uncertainties this one certainty creates. Have all her dreams, all her nightmares, and the strange thoughts that crossed her mind between sleep and wakefulness been real? Has she dreamt the past few weeks? No. They were real. Dora was there in that other apartment with her. All of that was real, too. No matter how little sense it makes, both of these places, both of these lives, are real. Her vision is a blur, but she senses Dora leaving the room and coming back into it. She feels a hand on her shoulder and is surprised that it doesn't pass right through her. But the touch holds, and things start to move towards their new positions without quite clicking into place. Then something wet is pressed to her forehead. The cold shock of it stops her sobbing, and she sits still as Dora wipes her face with a wet washcloth. This is her chair, her table, her home, her friend. This is her life, and this sobbing is her sobbing. The sobbing of ending a marriage that's already been over for years of parting from a life she gave up so long ago, of all these pains, fresh and imminent, aching within her like dread of things to come, burning like deep and recent wounds. She longs to sleep dreamlessly, to forget all that she remembers now, forget even having forgotten. She remembers leaving Yashim, remembers it until that pain is her only memory, until she forgets where she is. It's going to be okay, Hel, Dora says, pulling out the chair opposite her. I'm going to help you figure this thing out. For just a moment, Helena wants to ask, haven't you done enough?